Hello. I want to offer you a message for Easter with the title When Everything Changed because I think the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything for all of us. It can unsettle things that we think we know uh, and show us new things uh, and change our lives. I'm going to read part of John chapter 20 so that we can see this happening in the lives of uh, some of Jesus' followers. It was a time when his followers thought that everything had gone wrong. They'd been with him a few years. They thought that he was a wonderful person, that he had amazing abilities, that he was going to right all wrongs for them. Uh, but instead they'd seen him taken by the authorities uh, and framed in a rigged trial and put to death, crucified, a horrible death, and sealed into a tomb. That's the situation that they were in. Now I'd like to just notice and just do a bit of what you'd call apologetics first and, and point out that what we're going to read is personal recollection uh, and an eyewitness account by John the Apostle. There's no question of this being handed down to us by unknown people. Our Bible translators have done a very careful job of bringing it into English, into our language for us. And I know that some people say, well, Jesus and the people around him never actually existed, but it's all fiction. I say that that's just ignorance. Uh, the consensus of historians who know about the ancient world is that these people were real and they did exist and if anyone wants to disagree with that consensus well they can but the rest of us don't have to take their ideas seriously and historians do agree on the reality of Jesus of Nazareth and many of the people around him and some of the other things listed on the screen at the moment Bible scholars agree that John the Apostle actually wrote uh, what we're going to read in what we call the Gospel of John, which makes this eyewitness testimony. John the Apostle could hardly avoid being an eyewitness of the things that happened around Jesus. And that's what we're going to read now. One more thing we need to understand in what I'm going to read. Uh, John is writing in a modest way. Uh, he's not naming himself in the account we're going to read. He's the one he's calling the other disciple, along with Peter. Now, I hope that will make it make more sense. So I'm going to start reading in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. And I'll read on again in a minute. First of all, I'd like to show you uh, a, a piece of art, a picture. It's Peter and John running to the tomb by Eugène Bernand. It's apparently his most famous painting, and I think it shows well the breathless hurry uh, and the feelings of uncertainty on their faces about 
uh, not knowing what they're going to find and what's happening. We were told things very carefully in that account. We were told that they went together. They didn't touch anything when they got to the tomb. They agreed on what they saw. But what they saw didn't make sense. If someone had taken away Jesus' body, why would they have unwrapped it before they took it? That's a rather yucky idea, really, isn't it? If they were determined to unwrap that body, why would they take the time to carefully fold the smaller feet piece that had been around his head and put it aside separate from the rest? Well, my title for this was When Everything Changed, but it hasn't changed yet. Peter and John go away in this account none the wiser. They simply don't know what's happened. They can't explain what they've seen. The change comes next, and I'm going to read on. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Here's another picture of this scene. It's called Noli me tangere, which means don't hold on to me. That's what Jesus has just said. And it's by Hans Holbein the Younger. You know, I expect that in art, uh, the painting doesn't freeze an instant of time. It has everything happening at once in, in the narrative. There's Mary holding a jar of spices, which she's brought to the tomb. She's seen the angels in the tomb already. Now she's turning round to Jesus. Jesus is already saying, don't hold on to me. You can see that from his hands. Uh, but it's the moment of recognition. Her eyes are just coming up to the level of his face. She's about to realise who he is. It's that moment the moment when everything changed for her. She must have had contradictory thoughts. It can't be him, because I know he's dead, but it definitely is him. Wonder how we would react, faced with that contradiction, if we met someone that we knew had died. It would be a stunning thing, wouldn't it? How do we react to the idea that Jesus who lived and died almost 2,000 years ago, is alive now. I recall my conversion when I put my trust in him for the first time. I'd, I'd been refusing to believe. I, I'd considered it nonsense. But suddenly, uh, God offered me the chance to know him and trust him. And the question wasn't, uh, could I trust him? The question was, did I want to? Did I want to have that experience? And that I had to answer for myself. If anyone wants to know more about that, I'll be glad to tell them. Is anyone still thinking this could be just a work of fiction? Even though I did point out that it's an eyewitness account. Fiction wouldn't be like this. 
we say of things like this, you couldn't make it up. Uh, meaning that something has actually happened which is so improbable that no one would have dared to make it the point of a story. You see, in a narrative that had been constructed, uh, John and Peter wouldn't have gone away confused. Peter would have been the first one to encounter Jesus. That's because Mary Magdalene is a very minor character, uh, and even today we know almost nothing about her apart from this incident. Whereas Peter was destined to be the leader of Jesus' church, starting in Jerusalem. In any human endeavour, the people who started and who are the leaders of it uh, have a prominent role in the accounts of that. Peter has unfinished business with Jesus. Remember how he denied him three times in the courtyard. Uh, and surely needs to have a talk with Jesus to to restore things, to, to understand that he's forgiven. But actually, that doesn't get resolved until chapter 21, the next chapter, which looks very tacked on, uh, considering uh, what's happening here and now. But the point is that this is not a tidy story. This is untidy real life. We are being given an account of what actually happens. Uh, and if it's not satisfying as a narrative, well, that doesn't matter because it's what happened. In that instant where Mary Magdalene raised her eyes to the face of Jesus and heard his voice saying her name and recognised him, everything changed for her. It must have been absolutely stunning. Many things she'd been sure of turned out to be completely inaccurate, and that was probably a comfort. Because the appearance that Jesus had failed and had been defeated turns out to be wrong. It's actually a great victory that he's won. Particularly, things that she thinks about death and fears about it turn out to be untrue. And most of all, her situation before God is changed. And that's in what Jesus says. Jesus now talks about my father and your father, my God and your God, where he used to just talk about my father or the father. Now he's saying my God and your God. You can be in that situation. We can know this change too. By trusting and following Jesus Christ as our Lord, we can know God as our Father, because he loves us. That's the effect of Jesus' victory over death. To know that for ourselves changes everything for us too. At the end of the chapter, John underlines that. He actually writes out his purpose in giving us this eyewitness account. He says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I hope that that can be true for us, that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, put our trust in him and have life in his name. And I would end by saying this, if you haven't done it already, let him change everything for you this Easter.